Hark the glad sound, the Savior comes. The Savior promised long, let every heart prepare a throne and every voice a song. May I speak in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. I remember when. <clears throat> we all remember when in various ways and of various things. But today, <clears throat> tonight, today, I remember when Jessica and I were preparing for the birth of our son, Samuel. I remember those nine months of anticipation and thought, learning about not only the mechanics of childbirth and pregnancy, uh, but also considering all those things that make for a child's first years and preparing for them from colors and cribs and bumpers and diapers and more diapers and more diapers and bottles and lots of those as well. All of these preparations that went into becoming a parent. And as I think back to the, that year, 2008, as the case was, as I think back to that year, I wonder if I spent half as much time preparing my heart for parenthood as I spent preparing our space for Sam. Was I taking time as a young man, soon to be father, to consider what kind of father I wanted to be, let alone what kind of father God was calling me to be? What were the values of my fatherhood um, that I wanted to raise up within myself more than the instinctual qualities that might be within me, those things that I wanted to polish and bring to even more beautiful light? What were those qualities of a child? a young boy and soon to be young man or a young girl soon to be young woman that I wanted to nurture in Sam. I spent so much time consumed by the externals of parenthood. And I'll confess far too little on the internals of being a good father. We can all, I suspect, think about the various places of preparation in our own lives, from preparation for marriage. I could say the same about our marriage, Jessica and our en engagement and our preparation. How much time we spend on considering all of the external things of our wedding day with far less time, perhaps, spent concerned with what makes me a good husband and friend, partner and confident, confidant. We do this all the time. How much time we spend preparing for our week, the task of things that lie ahead, and how little time we think about the quality of person we will be throughout all of those tasks and all of those meetings, all of those relationships, whether they're at the store counter or the business desk. You know, 2,000 years ago, a community not greatly different than ours was asking this kind of question. The first Christians were gathering in their homes, communities of young families and elders and youth and children, they were gathering in their homes to ask a question about what does it mean to prepare our hearts, to prepare ourselves to be like Jesus. You see, they had fallen in love with Jesus. 
They had met him along the way. They had heard through others the story and the impact of his life upon them. They were hearing from people like St. Paul. They were hearing from the stories of Peter and John and James, these stories that were being carried out by other disciples and apostles throughout the, throughout the ancient Near East. And they were saying, I love that man. I want to give my life to that man. I want my life to be shaped by the life of Jesus, whom I've come to know through Peter or Paul or James. What does it take, they started to ask, to let our lives become infused with that grace, that kindness, that gratitude, that inherent goodness of Jesus? This is a bit of what Paul is saying in his letter to the church in Thessalonica. We heard just a little bit of it this, this morning towards the end. Uh, we're, we're towards the end of the, the letter. It's one of the earliest letters that we have, one of the earliest writings we have um, from Paul and from the ancient church. And we'll notice in this letter, Paul spends very little time on the externals. You take the whole, the whole um, library of Paul's writings, we hear about practices such as the Eucharist. We hear about the assembly of the church, the ecclesia. But through and through, he is talking about the essentials of the human heart. He says to his churches, pay attention to your heart more than you pay attention to what's going on around you. And so he says this morning, we heard this morning, rejoice always. Give thanks in all circumstances. Hold fast to what is good. Develop this character within you. Develop the character of gratitude and celebration in your daily life. Notice he doesn't say give thanks for all things, but rather give thanks in all circumstances. That is to say, not all things are good, but in all places there is good. Not all people are always good, but in all people there is good. Find the ability within yourself to celebrate that goodness, to rejoice in that quality of another, to see the beauty, the kindness, the mercy that is already part of your world and your life. These things you see come from God. He says, hold fast to what is good, not to what is profitable, not to what is successful, not to what is powerful or valuable, but what is good. <clears throat> what is kind. What gives life to the world or to another. Hold fast to these things. So we might ask ourselves, well, how do we do that? How do I become that person that reflects the life of Jesus by rejoicing, by giving thanks, by developing this heart of gratitude and appreciation, and with the strength and fortitude to hold on to what is good in order that I might abstain from what is evil? You know, the church over the years has um, kind of hone down, if you will, the science of discipleship to a few simple things. Right? We've honed down, the external world has honed down the, the, the science of being productive. Stephen Covey. Um, being fit. Tybo comes to mind. Don't ask me why Tybo just ran through my mind. But that was the thing that went through my mind for how to get fit. Right? Our world has developed all of these systems that perfect the externals of our life. 
the church has honed as well the things that help our hearts. I'm going to offer a couple of them, just as simple reminders. Your presence here. Paul says it a little differently. Pray without ceasing. Be regular and consistent. Stephen Covey says to start every day by by sharpening the saw, if you remember the Stephen Covey language, right? Going back over your day, remembering your values, what is productive to your life, what are the priorities, what are the A1 responsibilities of your day. Spend every day, Stephen Covey, just 15 minutes a day, he says. Spend 15 minutes of your day sharpening your saw so that you can be productive through the day. Well, it's an ancient Christian practice to spend just a few minutes every day not looking at your task list, but looking at your heart and remembering the heart of God in order that you can see both your aspiration and your reality and hold yourself up through the day to be the person that is grateful in all circumstances, rejoicing in all good. Here we are, Advent 3. We've been talking about preparation for now three weeks, preparing for the incarnation of of our Lord. And we're doing all kinds of things to prepare ourselves. We're decking the halls, we're lighting Christmas trees, We're wrapping presents. We're shopping and shopping and shopping and shopping and shopping. We're checking our list and checking it twice. We're doing all the things. But are we doing the internal thing? Are we taking the time to be still and to remember what we are giving thanks for? Are we taking time to think about what gift we genuinely want to give to our children and grandchildren. Not just the bauble that they'll put up on the shelf, but a gift of a heart of gratitude and joy that they can carry with them all the days of their lives. Are we preparing ourselves to follow Jesus? This is the heart of Advent time. The church gives us four weeks to kind of make our way through from the anxiety of, oh my goodness, Christmas is just three weeks away. Yes, that was true on the first Sunday of Advent. Right? To, wait a second, what is Christmas all about? I said at the beginning of our, uh, before worship began, that next Sunday is Advent 4. I meant that as a gift to you. You have seven days to prepare for Christmas. And you will be consumed in those seven days with all of the externals. You have one more day, seven if you want to take them all, but you have another day to be still and prepare for the coming of Christ. I suggest you make that a priority in order that Christmas Eve and Christmas Day and the 12 days that follow may may be days of genuine joy Days in which you are satisfied that you have given the greatest gift you have to offer, your best and kindest self to the world. Amen.